Today's presentations begin to explore the truth and the real environmental degradation, degradation right here in Northwest Indiana. This is not some issue that's way across the country. This is right here, right now, okay? And um, we're all affected, but as with anything, sometimes these th threats affect some people more than others. So we're gonna talk about the injustice of that as well. Um, we're gonna take a few minutes in between each speaker to have a little moment of reflection and shuffle the microphone. So we'll ask you to be present with us in that moment as you reflect by yourself or with your neighbor. Our first speaker today is Thomas Frank. Thomas is an artist and an organizer in Northwest Indiana. He works for environmental and climate justice in the Calumet and Great Lakes regions. And Thomas is gonna be taking us on a toxic tour of Northwest Indiana. I'm gonna ask Thomas to come up. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about his background. So as I mentioned, Thomas, you brought the gloves and the masks and the goggles, right, that we're gonna need for this I toxic tour. The, uh, signs. The, okay. The protest signs. Okay, so use your imagination, okay? <laughs> Thomas is a lead organizer with the Community Strategy Group in East Chicago. He's a board member of the Southeast Environmental Task Force. He's the founder of 350 Indiana and the Doomlands Environmental Justice Alliance. And he's a member of the Southeast Chicago Coalition to ban Pet Coke or Petroleum Coke. He has worked with at-risk teens in a boating, aquatics, and marine science program through Purdue University Northwest. He's also served as the executive director of the Indiana Harbor Shipping Canal, which is considered the most polluted body of water in the country. Thomas became active in environmental and climate justice with the announcement that BP would be building the largest tar sands refinery in the country in his community of East Chicago. As we embark on our journey, Thomas is going to lead us, lead us through this tour. Thank you, Thomas. I'm going to try to set up here a little bit and walk around. Um, let me see here. All right, so I'm going to actually give you a toxic tour of East Chicago. I'm going to focus on that. I've been giving these kinds of tours. Uh, physically to get people out there in a visceral space to breathe and be a part of that space and understand that space. That's, there's a way of understanding how we organize white spaces compared to spaces for uh, people of color and black uh, people in our region. How many people here are from Northwest Indiana and have been to East Chicago? All right, just a very few. All right, so this, this will be a, an, uh, an understanding. So I'm, I'm gonna start with an environmental uh, justice framework, going in talking about East Chicago, Indiana, uh, given an environmental context. We'll talk about some of the EJ uh, campaigns we're doing. I'm going to dip a little bit into climate justice because you can't separate these issues. You can't separate a lot of these social justice issues. And then I'll talk a little quickly about uh, the culture of resistance. So I, to give you an understand, I married into East Chicago a little over 20 years ago. And I brought my perspectives from the north side of Chicago down to East Chicago, which was a very different perspective. I now live in a community that has the largest private investment in Indiana's history, in my community. I also live in a community that has destroyed or torn down three neighborhoods, or in the process of this de tearing down three neighborhoods in the last 20 years due to environmental conditions and threats. The last 100 years, East Chicago has identified itself as the most industrial city in the world. And for, for practical purposes, it probably really is. We have a whole industrial culture on the southern shores of Lake Michigan. This is from Indiana Days. This was a poem that was, uh, that was uh, um, read out loud in, uh, in 1908. The skies are often dreary and the air is filled with smoke in Northwest Indiana from the gas, the coal, and coke. But we wouldn't be without it, for it's just the way we grow in Northwest Indiana where the furnace fires glow. We also see ourselves as the, uh, the uh, workshop of America. You've probably seen these uh, posters around the region. That's, a, me that's a, a metaphor that people have been living on. If you look, if I go back really quickly, you see smoke, right? Smoke for people the last 100 years in this working class community meant jobs. It meant kids went to school, they got fed, 
They went on to college. Today, we're shifting that metaphor over and we're talking about it as poison. And that's a really different change. Also to understand where we are, we're on the southern shores of Lake Michigan, right outside the Chicago metropolitan area. Try to understand that political equation. Chicago metropolitan area has 7.1 million people in it on the Illinois side. That's more than the entire population of Indiana. So what I consider us is the industrial, we have, we're kind of this industrial fiefdoms on the southern shores in the Calumet Industrial Quarter, but we're also an industrial colony of Chicago. We're kind of pushed and pulled between Chicago and Indianapolis. But also on the southern shores of Lake Michigan, because of the way the glaciers receded, we're, we're now considered the seventh most biodiverse region on the continent. Just 15 years ago, we were considered the fourth. We're losing biodiversity quite significantly. If you've been to the dunes, uh, you know about how large those dunes are. But you don't know about them in Chicago or in Gary or East Chicago. I don't know how many of you know they tore down the dunes, plowed them down to build inland, uh, U.S. Steel in downtown Gary, and they took that sand and infilled the downtown Chicago area. So they raised Chicago eight feet with the dunes sand on the southern shores. In East Chicago, what you would have seen a hundred years ago, you would have seen dunes on the lakefront 20 feet high. Now we have dunes in swale, and this is where. The Chicagoland area decided it's going to put its industrial uh, infrastructure in. So if you look on the southern shores of Lake Michigan, you got two thirds of it, almost 20 linear miles, 27 linear miles of industrial gated community. You have the, up on the, on the right hand side there to, the, to Michigan City, we preserved that. We, we secured that land because in the 1950s, Indiana wanted to build steel mills all the way across the lakefront. But it wasn't Indiana that saved the dunes. It was a congressman or a senator from Chicago or Illinois, Senator Douglas. We didn't have that power and we still don't have a lot of that decision making power here. This is, if you look on the southern shores of Lake Michigan, one of the most distinctive features on Google Earth is this peninsula out into Lake Michigan. That's all the industrial waste that they built the industry on top of. Everything in blue in this map is infill because these were dunes and swale everything on this map in blue is industrial waste or slag that they infilled the dune or the dunes and swale to build a pond so we had neighborhoods and industry built upon slag and ash and whatnot here's a, a, a view of our lakefront uh, as i say it's an industrial gated community so real quickly we'll focus now on east chicago Everything in purple in this map, 80% of East Chicago is zoned heavy industrial. Only 14 or 17% of East Chicago is residential. And since the 1950s, uh, what we've seen is industry uh, shooting infrastructure through neighborhoods, cutting one neighborhood off of another because prior to World War II, the union grew strong and they were unionizing in the neighborhoods. But in East Chicago, the, the, the industry was effective in using urban planning to break through those neighborhoods. Uh, this is a comp uh, an environmental inventory I did about 10 years ago. I was doing a comprehensive plan. Everything, anything that goes red gets more and more toxic, and that's the land. So we're sitting in a, sit a situation where I kind of say we've killed off the environment. We have ecocide on the lakefront. Most of that 27 linear miles have been destroyed, the ecosystems have been entirely destroyed. And what we're seeing today is a sacrifice community. We have three neighborhoods, we have Marktown, the Brickyard, and now we have West Calumet. These are the three neighborhoods that are being torn down as we speak. So this all happens in a context. We have the context of our waterways. Indiana discharges more toxic waste into its waterways than any other state in the union. In fact, Indiana discharges 30% more toxic waste into its waterways than the second worst offender. If you're going to take the last 26 uh, states combined, which represent over 100 million people in population, Indiana still discharges more than all of them. George Beach on the lakefront in East Chicago, we have probably 100 uh, yards of uh, lakefront exposure. George Beach is considered the third most polluted beach in the, in the, uh, in the United States and the most polluted beach in the Great Lakes system. Now to our airshed. There are 3,143 counties in the United States. 
Lake County generally ranks in the top 10 or top 15 for industrial, toxic industrial releases into the atmosphere. And that's almost entirely attributed to BP, ArcelorMittal, and U.S. Steel, all of which reside in East Chicago and Gary on our lakefront. This is a really important framework to understand, is how we allocate our resources in our political economy here in the United States under capitalism. There, the American Bar Association identifies there are 30,000 environmental attorneys working full-time in the United States. 28,000 of them work full-time for industry and corporations. Less than 2,000 work full-time for government agencies, whether at the federal, state, or local re level. And then, of course, uh, nonprofits, which are often formed by industries as well, less than 600 uh, full-time employees, uh, environmental attorneys. And of course, nature doesn't employ an environmental attorney. I think we have to flip this completely over, all around. All right, this is back to the East Chicago. This is the Indian Harbor Shipping Canal. This is what I used to be the director of. My task was to clean this up and address the, the contamination on the adjacent properties along its shorelines. This is an overview of it, uh, where you can see the Indiana Shipping Canal, oops, Indiana Shipping Canal uh, linking down into the Grand Calumet River at the bottom of the image. This is the Indiana Shipping Canal in 1968 uh, in Time Magazine. You can see the oil floating on the surface. 1969, 1970, you can just put your hand in it. The oil industry used to filter its systems in the waterway. This is uh, just a few years ago on one of my toxic tours. I've been giving it a toxic tour for about nine, ten years. There are always oil floating on the surface. Fish are often uh, floating as well. Now, one of the context for this is obviously the industrialization in the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes region. In the 1980s, we started deindustrializing. We started t taking that capital and moving it overseas for cheaper labor. And that's when the EPA identified what they called 43 areas of concern. The Indian Harbor Shipping Canal was one of those. And in fact, it was um, considered the most impacted area. It's the only body of water that's failed all 14 beneficial uses that they measure this by. One of the most think, distinctive features of this is 90% of the river consists of wastewater from industry and sewage. Here's a map of overview of East Chicago. Everything that you see in blue and yellow and all those plumes up there, that's BP's refinery. There's 16.8 million gallons of oil that had been released into, onto the water table in that area. And, it's, and we discovered it in early 1990, and it's been there ever since. BP has never been fined for it. There's never been a cleanup project, and it's still there today. Um, upon that, you can see the CDF. Because of the project I was doing to clean up the Indian Harbor Shipping Canal, we call it dredging the canal, we needed to take those toxic dredgings and put them somewhere. Well, where they decided to locate it was, a, was into what we call a CDF, a confined disposal facility next to our high school and elementary school. This is the CDF. It's a 168-acre site. Uh, you can see all the oil infrastructure around it. Just to the south of it, one-third of a mile is our high school, Central High School. Another project that we're looking at, we've been organizing in the last year about, is the Innie Arbor Coke Company. They're up on the peninsula of Arcer Middle. You can imagine a Coke oven, or an oven, the size of a tractor trailer, the trailer of a tractor trailer. Now think about 268 of those ovens lined one side by side. They have a length of a mile long. That's what they are operating on the peninsula of Arsimittal. This is a company that has been out of compliance with the air permit for over 10 years with nearly 9,000 or more than 9,000 air violations. They're up for a renewal right now. Now this image, I usually put things in black and white. This isn't a black and white image. This is a color image. And that's, that's the facility. All right, I'm gonna talk a little quickly about uh, the US lead Superfund site. It's one of the issues that we finally got you know, attention to. Um, this is an area of three neighborhoods. We, we consider them zone one, zone two, zone three. 
Uh, really, this issue has been something to be fighting for uh, for over 40 years. US-led, super or USS-led, shut down its facilities in 1985. We knew there were problems there. We had we did some lead testing randomly or through the neighborhoods and found some really high levels. But really, in Zone One is where the uh, housing complex. Many of you may have heard of it recently, the West Calumet neighborhood. This is really what brought attention to this because over 40 years when they've been doing their lead testing and arsenic testing and cadmium and other issues, they really did not find that many high levels. And if you see the little blue boxes there, that's where they were testing in those little blue boxes. What they discovered when they finally did some comprehensive testing this last couple of years was that 97% of, of the land was highly contaminated. And let me give you an understanding. Uh, 400 parts per million of lead in the soil triggers a cleanup. 1,200 parts per million in the, in the soil is an emergency action. What they found in, US, in West Calumet was 91,000 parts per million in the soil. And they found 32,000 parts per million in the residents' homes, in the dust. So for, for 40 years they were testing, but they seemed to miss the 97% of the land where it was really heavily contaminated. So, we, so the residents of the mayor held, hold, held the meeting of the residents and told them that they can go anywhere in the world, that he was the giver of blessings. I'm going to pay for you to go to your, to your uh, tropical paradise. But what we really have here is a whole room full of people that became environmental refugees. 1,200 people. It wasn't a very nice experience. It was a really horrible, horrible experience to try to deal with the housing issues. Uh, but what we did did is we got a lot of candidates coming up to Chicago. We have a lot of attorneys from universities showing up. We have attorneys that showed up in limousines. We had a lot of attention suddenly from a lot of people that found ways to advance their, their careers or their financial well-being. But in the meantime, the residents of East Chicago had to deal with the digging up of their yards, the, the fear of what's happening. One yard is being dug up and another yard isn't, and they're wondering, are they contaminated? They're wondering now about their history of health problems and their neighbor's health problems, and they're talking amongst each other, and they're finding, wow, I have the very similar health problems that you have. And they're now bidding together a narrative that seems to link themselves to the industrial legacy and what's been left and what's been allowed to happen in East Chicago. So I'm going to skip over now to Marktown. Marktown is a, on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it's it's uh, what's called the Garden City concept. It was built in 1917. And about 2007, BP announced that they were going to build this tar sands refinery, a $4.5 billion refinery uh, right across the street from Marktown. Many people know the BP refinery to be the Whiting refinery. What they, what they don't realize is with this brand new project. Think about this. This happened in our era. This isn't 200 years ago, 100 years ago. They moved the refinery out of the refining capacity out of Whiting and into East Chicago and right across the street from Marktown. In, Mar in East Chicago, they awarded BP $165 million to do this in East Chicago. And then a month after BP went on line uh, in the March of 2000. 14, a month later, they started sending out notices that they're going to tear down Marktown. So right now, about 15% of Marktown has been torn down. They're using the marketplace to, to move on these properties. The medium home value in Marktown is $25,000. So they really have very little market maneuvering. How many people can sell their home for $25,000 out of Marktown and go anywhere else? Try to give you a context with that $25,000, what that means. Uh, the medium home value in the United States is over $220,000. The medium home value in East Chicago is $55,000. The medium home value in some of our neighborhoods that are fence lines with industry is between $14,000 and $25,000. So we've been organizing Save Marktown. It's been very difficult, but BP is just using the marketplace and moving in and tearing down, buying up and tearing down. Property values are dropping very significantly. Now people are in a rush to get out before the property values break down even further. And this is the refinery. It's sitting on 1,400 acres on the lakefront of, East, of uh, uh, East Chicago and Whiting. You can see Chicago in the up in the north there. 
to give you an understanding, 1,400 acres is about the same footprint as the loop in Chicago. So when they went online with the new refinery in 2014 and they put out the notice that they're going to tear down Mark County, first they said they want to build a parking lot. People kind of laughed because there's a lot of brown fields around there. So they changed their, their concept. They said, we're no longer going to do a parking lot. We want to build green space. We want to tear down a garden city and make green space. At the same time that happened, uh, they had a major spill into Lake Michigan with tar sands uh, product, and I'll talk a little bit about that. They had several malfunctions at the facility uh, through the last couple of years. Now, to understand what happened is in 2002, we moved our refining capacity off of Saudi Arabian light sweet crude and went to uh, the crude up in northern Alberta. I visited there about 10 years ago. This is the largest engineering project in human history. This is a project, this, what they're doing is mountaintop removal the size of the state of Florida. And this is on, un, much of it is on unceded land. To so understand where it's happening, it's happening in the uh, ancient boreal forest, the largest carbon sink on the planet. This is also happens to be the largest deforestation project on the planet. It's, out, it's outstripped the Amazon as well. And so on the left hand side is what the boreal forest used to look like. On the right hand side is what we call productive use. This is what they're putting into pipelines and sending down to BP. This is why we're hearing a lot of these pipeline movements, uh, protests and opposition and resistance from Standing Rock even to down here with the Kalamazoo River spill. So as you can see, there's a pattern here, a pattern developing here. I'm actually much further ahead than I thought I would. I'm speaking much faster. So there's a real pattern here. It's not just at where they're extracting it. And they're piping it down here, and we're having to deal with the industrial uh, processes. Think about this. They're extracting billions and billions of land to get uh, iron ore, limestone, and they're barging it, shipping it down to East Chicago to, to, to make product out of it, or in Gary, and they're making product. And then they make that product, and then they're able to ship it or put it on rail to send it to market, right? But the byproduct remains in East Chicago and Gary. And what we're seeing is thousands and thousands of acres of landfills and, and deposits. And in fact, that peninsula, that nearly 3,000 acres that they have their, refi or their uh, steel mill is on top of industrial waste. The Arsenal Middle, think about this. We have in East Chicago, 12 square miles, we have the largest tar sands refinery in North America with BP. We also have the largest integrated steel mill in the Western Hemisphere in East Chicago. And then on our borders, we have U.S. Steel. Oops, I went back here. So what we've been able to organize recently, uh, really not much, uh, there's been some movements in the 80s and 90s on environmental justice, kind of, I wouldn't even say environmental justice. There was some environmental justice movement, but a lot of environmentalism. And we have a lot of those kinds of fights isolated from the justice fight. And right now, I think we're really kicking into some environmental justice movements occurring here. I started with the resistance here with uh, a quote from Gloria Richards, which I think is really apt here. A first class citizen does not beg for freedom. A first class citizen does not need uh, to plead to the white power structure to give him or her something that whites have no power to give or take away. Human rights are white, or human rights are human rights not white rights. And the idea is the same thing with the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land we use, the biodiversity we're a part of and we're losing very quickly. These are not things we need to demand the power, white power structure, which is corporate now, for us to have. This is something we should just take. It's ours. It's always been ours. It's what we need to sustain ourselves. So in East Chicago, we've, been, we've organized what's called the uh, uh, Calumet Lives Matter within the Superfund site specific to one of the neighborhoods. Uh, we have organized the community strategy group. What we had, we've been doing is we've been forcing, creating pressure and escalating issues. For instance, we, we, we escalated the issue with the mayor to make a request of the governor to declare a disaster area here. The, our first meetings with the mayor, the mayor was not willing to, so we ended up having a press conference and then occupying his offices until he was willing to do that. And then we were able to get several uh, million dollars uh, for lead contamination. We organized with EJ communities around the Great Lakes. 
We had about 250, 300 people to go to the EPA's Region 5 office and make demands of them. We delivered in unison our set of demands. That's with Flint, with uh, Detroit, Kalamazoo, Elkhart, East Chicago, Gary, and the southeast side of Chicago. We, we forced Pruitt to come to East Chicago. It was the first time he had a public appearance. Uh, we d we've been doing water distribution in East Chicago. One of the things that we forced the EPA was to test the water because we wanted to deal with the multiple pathways of lead. And so we've been doing water distribution for the last year and a half. We organized Save Marktown. That's not been a very positive uh, campaign at this point. Uh, we brought about 50 people, 25 people from East Chicago and Gary to DC for the climate march this last uh, May. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we ha organized the Break Free Midwest at the BP refinery where Bill McKibbins came, Tara Huska with Honor the Earth, um, Malik Youssef with the Hip Hop Caucus, and about 41 of us got arrested. Uh, and now is what we're, where we're at today. Uh, we're needing to expand throughout the Great Lakes region. We're expanding through the southern shores of Lake Michigan, but we've also joined the Poor People's Campaign. And I really encourage everybody here to join the Poor People's Campaign. This is this year, 2018, is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King being assassinated. We're kicking this campaign off on the balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, on April 4th. And then we're going to Caravan to DC. We're doing actions in 25 states across the, great, uh, across the country and in DC. We're expecting people for 40 days to risk arrest at their state houses and in, in DC. So I've got some uh, flyers for that that I can pass out. And with that, I think I'll stop. And by the way, this is a view outside my window. If you don't believe in climate change. Our next group of speakers are VU professors who have been working right here in Northwest Indiana to address contaminated soil issues due to industrial pollution in East Chicago. Their session is entitled, Using Chemistry to Address the Health Concerns of a Local Community. Okay, um, and now I'm going to introduce you to our, our next uh, speakers who are going to talk about something very relevant to what you've just been hearing. Um, so you may or may not know that VU has been involved with some of what you've just heard about. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, as our uh, first speaker Thomas Frank mentioned, is funding a cleanup of contamination in East Chicago due to pollution from the industries there. And the VU professors and students are working on those sites doing some of the soil testing in conjunction with the neighborhood and with um, some of the neighborhood coalition. So the people working on this campus, uh, professors Chris Eisman and Julie Peller. Um, Julie was not able to be here today, but Professor Chris Eisman will talk about the work that um, VU faculty and students have been doing with the residents to analyze the soil. And they are in partnership with Sam Henderson, our second speaker, of the Hoosier Environmental Council. Their presentation is entitled, Using Chemistry to Address the Health Concerns of a Local Community. So, I guess one of you, and then, We'll maybe let Sam hold this <laughs> <laughs> microphones and stuff. So I guess we can okay. we can flip flop we back can, and forth. Can. Yeah. Um, uh, so this was our our title before. I guess uh, we sort of changed that up a little bit. Um, so again, my name is Chris Eisman. I'm a professor of chemistry here at uh, Valparaiso University. Uh, and my name's Sam Henderson, and I'm a staff attorney with the Hoosier Environmental Council. Um, so uh, we both feel very privileged to be a part of this uh, celebration here today, and I really would like to take time to acknowledge our collaborator, Dr. Julie Peller, uh, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, today, um, but she has been a real main part of, of this work as well. Um, so I thought a lot about what it means to be talking here today. Um, and I think, you know, typically as a chemistry professor, the idea is that I get all of you to fall asleep uh, by the time I'm done talking. Um, but uh, rather than talk about chemistry and kind of some of the details of what we're doing, 
I thought it would be really nice if we sort of focused on the community that we've been working with um, because that's really the important part of what we're doing. Um, and so uh, we have been doing a lot of interesting chemistry and environmental sampling uh, in East Chicago and I'm more than happy to talk to you about the details of that at any time uh, after the talk. Um, but let's, let's get going with talking about the, the community that we're working with uh, in East Chicago. Uh, so I uh, put up a picture here um, because I really wanted to show you what I think could be described as, as anywhere America. Uh, I think a lot of times when we have this picture in our head of environmental contamination, especially with levels of lead uh, and arsenic as high as we're seeing uh, in this community, we have sort of a more industrialized viewpoint of what that might look like. Uh, and this could be anybody's front yard, anybody's street. It could be anybody's park area or school. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, this community uh, is just northwest of Valpo here. So we got a great introduction to where it is from Thomas. Um, and uh, it's a large swath of both industrialized and productive lakeshore uh, with a very rich history, very strong sense of community. Um, what I'd like to uh, move on to now then uh, is to talking about the people that are part of this community as well. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Sam. Uh, all right, I hold, I hold this and then I do that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this, this is uh, Maritha Lopez, who is uh, one of many, many community members who have uh, been speaking out and uh, uh, taking ownership of the process of the contamination in their community. Uh, she's uh, 54 years old but has uh, health problems that would typically be associated with a much older person and in that way uh, she faces many similar health problems to people uh, throughout the affected neighborhoods uh, of the USS Lead Superfund site in East Chicago. Uh, she has um, significant arsenic and lead contamination uh, in her in her home and indeed in her body, just as uh, many of her neighbors do. And um, this has, um, you know, pr profound effects on the health of, uh, of the entire neighborhood, which have been uh, confirmed in the testing uh, conducted by uh, professors Peller and Iceman here at Valpo, um, showing uh, not only high lead levels in the yards, but high lead levels in the homes, in the basements, and uh, indeed even in the vacuum bag, so it's, it's literally in the dust you're breathing. Uh, and I think a lot of times we don't think, you know, about how much dust there is around us in our homes. We don't see it, but we're breathing it in all the time. There's dust in this carpet, there, there's dust in, in the upholstery, there's dust on our clothes, and, you know, if, if there's lead and arsenic in that dust, it's going to get into your body. Um, and so it's, it's a big question. Um, that certainly a lot of people are working on is how did, how did things get um, to this situation? And uh, we think that's, that's something that requires uh, all of us in Northwest Indiana uh, to think about. So uh, I wanted to put up a map real quick of the area that we're talking about. Um, and we've had introduction from Thomas already about a lot of these places. And, Right here is, is the USS uh, Lead Superfund site, as it were, um, that's really affecting the communities that we're working with. Uh, of course, the West Calumet uh, Housing Complex and Kerry Gosh Elementary School, um, they've been basically evacuated. Um, and these uh, homes and residences in, in, this areas, in these areas then are, are going through some form of remediation, most of them. Uh, but I wanted to show you how surrounded this community is. And, and on this particular site here in the red was actually where a lead smelting facility existed before. Anaconda lead in somewhat of a partnership with USS lead. Uh, USS lead occupied this space down here. Uh, just across the street then uh, is the DuPont facility uh, that's produced for boy, 100 years plus, um, lots of pesticides, many of them including lead uh, and others. Uh, over here to the right, uh, if we can get my pointer to work, we have a uh, sort of an oil depot where I think it's currently owned by Sitgo, maybe BP, but uh, that's a lot of, a lot of the uh, underground pipes that uh, haul 
all oil around the area come to this particular terminal. Uh, and then up here to the north, we have uh, Cargill Steel and various other uh, steel refineries that are, that are also working. Uh, but in particular, we're working with uh, residents in, in zones uh, two and three uh, in, in, our, in our work. Um, so anyway, that's an introduction uh, to the facilities around the community. And uh, the EPA has been, as, uh, as Thomas Frank mentioned, has been aware of contamination in this neighborhood for uh, more than 40 years. And uh, it's only been in the past few years that uh, cleanup has really begun. The picture here you're seeing is the, uh, the West Calumet community, uh, which uh, until last year was home to more than 1,000 people, uh, all of whom uh, have now been turned into, uh, into refugees or forced to find, uh, in many cases, much less satisfactory living conditions, whether they've stayed here in the region uh, or in East Chicago, or they've, they've had to move, in some cases, uh, hundreds of miles away. Um, and the, uh, the contamination here has a lot of sources. Well, in, in, in West Calumet, it has one big source because this community was built in the 1970s, literally on the site of the Anaconda lead refinery uh, that, that, that Chris showed in the last slide. Uh, but throughout the community, uh, there are additional sources of contamination. Uh, there is the history of windblown dust from the USS lead facility just to the south. And there is also a history that is still not really been adequately addressed or analyzed of groundwater contamination from the DuPont facility, where for more than 100 years they were dumping a great range of chemical wastes, uh, including many lead and arsenic products, including DDT, including uh, Freon manufacturing products, and uh, a lot of things that I would have to leave to the chemists uh, to fully explain. Um, but uh, as a result, you see this this complicated contamination where it's not just on the surface necessarily, it may be soaking into your basement, it may be deeper in the soil, and, and it may come at you from a lot of different sources, and that's one reason why uh, the level of lead contamination in the drinking water is also a concern, even though it comes from a different source, it comes from the lead leaching out of your pipe. You know, once that lead is in your body, it doesn't care where it came from, it's gonna add up to that same uh, level of exposure. And so the EPA's uh, cleanup here, unfortunately, uh, has to date uh, primarily just been to scrape off the top two feet of soil where that's accessible and not scrape it off where they can't get to it. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, that doesn't address groundwater. Uh, it doesn't address other areas of soil uh, that haven't been tested or haven't been excavated. Uh, and so that's, that's still leaving a lot of problems that uh, the many community groups in this area are continuing uh, to try to address and to try to push the EPA to address. Um, and I, 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 I want to call attention to the fact that, uh, you, you know, I, I think you can say there's, there's been a lot of work done in East Chicago over the past couple of years, and that's true. Uh, but you also have to say that this contamination and the human suffering it has caused has not been taken nearly as seriously as it would be if you had a dump right here next door in Valparaiso. Um, and, and I think, you know, there, there are many sources for that, but you can, you can look to one of them from uh, the same mechanics in our society that lead to the fact that we're, we're here um, talking about uh, the suffering and the activism and the struggle of, uh, overwhelmingly black and Hispanic city and community in the Calumet neighborhood of East Chicago. And, uh, you, you know, I'm the third white guy up here talking about this. And that's, that's a problem. And uh, it, it's an even bigger problem because you have that same lack of representation among the decision makers, you know, in the EPA uh, and, and elsewhere in the state government even to some extent in local government. And, you know, that, that leads to a lot of implicit bias and it leads to people not taking as seriously the suffering of people who look different from them as they do the suffering of people who look like them and they can identify with. And that's, unfortunately, that's 
uh, the, an almost universal human property, uh, but it's something we have to deal with better in the systems we have to address environmental contamination because otherwise uh, the human toll is unacceptable and we all suffer from the existence of these sacrifice zones um, in, in many different ways. So I think we, we all have a stake in not just trying to clean up issues in East Chicago, but in trying to clean up the issues in our society and our economy that have made this possible. Um, uh, so as we get to wrapping up here, um, you know, I think one thing we can continue to talk about maybe um, in, in the question and answer session too is, is looking at these kinds of complicated problems that are historical, uh, historical in an area that took great pride in uh, the industries, but this has also uh, resulted in a lot of, a lot of harm uh, to this area. Um, you know, this area essentially built America in many ways. All of our cities are steel. Uh, many of these resources came uh, from right here in East Chicago. Um, I think it's also true we could maybe, in a more broad sense, look at what happens not just here, but also in our nation, in our, in our world. Uh, obviously, here's a picture of Houston. Uh, all those dots on the screen there show either a Superfund site or a restricted chemical site uh, by the EPA. They were all underwater recently with the devastation from Hurricane Harvey. That's going to be a legacy for this community uh, as well as, you know, nationally as well as internationally. Um, I'd encourage you democratically to take part in some sort of uh, process here to share your ideas. We just threw up a couple of uh, slides here for places you can get in contact with your representatives uh, to express that. Um, and just real quick before we're done, I want to thank uh, the Wheat Ridge Foundation, which is now the We Raise uh, Foundation for the funding for this work, uh, Valparaiso University, of course, uh, the Center for Environmental Science and Technology was where we ran a lot of our samples, uh, the Hoosier Environmental Council. Uh, I'd also like to thank Zoe and Ashita, who are both here in the audience today for their hard work uh, on a lot of this data, the students that were working on this project. Um, and then finally, also uh, Warren and Kathy Cosman, who have recently donated some new equipment to us that will allow us to do uh, science faster and quicker for this community in the future. So uh, thank you for your time. Our third speaker is Professor Andrew Reardon. He's going to talk about how unequal access to food in this country is connected to structural racism. He's going to discuss how the food movement is working to address these issues in the food system with something it calls food justice. As the fourth white guy to talk about issues that primarily affect communities of color, um, I am directing a lot of what I'm talking about to folks of privilege in this room. Um, Martin Luther King made similar remarks about how it's up to white folks to really critically analyze what's going on. And so I'd like to just put that up front. Um, so I've been asked to talk about food justice and connect that to issues of environmental injustice. And in order to do that, I'd like to start with words that Dr. King had to say on food justice. On March 31st in 1968, Dr. King gave his final sermon at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. In the sermon, he touched on a lot of topics, including, of all things, food justice, although he didn't call it that. Um, referring to the Emancipation Proclamation, and its impact on former slaves, Dr. King made the following remark, and I quote, it, the Emancipation Proclamation, simply said, you're free, and it left former slaves there penniless, illiterate, and not knowing what to do. And the irony of it all is that at the same time the nation failed to do anything for the black man, through an act of Congress, it was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did it give the land, it built land-grant colleges to teach them how to farm. Not only that, it provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. And not only that, but as the years unfolded, it provided low interest rates so that they could mechanize their farms. And to this day, thousands of these very persons are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies every year not to farm. And these are so often the very people that tell black men they must lift themselves by their bootstraps. It's all right to tell a man to lift himself by his own bootstraps, 
but it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his bootstraps. What Dr. King is referencing is a series of federal programs that laid the groundwork for our modern U.S. food system and, ultimately, the contemporary landscape of racial inequality that we see throughout this food system. While we frequently talk about the positive impact that these programs had on farming as a whole, we rarely discuss how these and other food and farm policies were also racial projects, explicitly designed with the intent to advantage white male citizens and to exclude people of color. For instance, the Homestead Act, which Dr. King is referencing here, uh, gave away up to 160 acres of land to each individual farmer that applied. But African Americans were frequently denied access either by formal rejection or, more commonly, by informal threats of violence. This isn't even to mention the fact that the land that was being given away was actually occupied by Native Americans, who were then forcefully relocated or killed in order to make way for white farmers. In many cities, similar institutional policies, such as redlining and restrictive housing covenants, purposefully created a racialized environment that deliberately segregated people of color in crumbling neighborhoods, while simultaneously denying them the access to the capital to invest in their communities. So, what does all of this have to do with food? Well, because today we continue to see racial disparities in the food system that stem from these past instances of institutional racism. Across the U.S., about one in 10 households are food insecure, and by that we mean they struggle to access adequate or enough food at some point during the month. But when we look at these numbers broken down by race, we see that one in four households of color are food insecure, and that these numbers are as high as one in two on some Native American reservations. Studies show that people of color are much more likely to live in what we call food deserts, low-income neighborhoods where residents must travel a mile or more to access a full-service grocery store. Studies show that within these food deserts, instead of living close to grocery stores with fresh produce or whole foods, that residents are much more likely to live near gas stations, liquor stores, and fast food restaurants. As a result, we see that people of color, and especially children, are much more likely to suffer higher rates of diet-related illnesses, such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and cancer, in large part because of their access to good food. All told, African Americans are expected to die almost five years sooner than their white counterparts, and in large part because of their, their, these diet-related health conditions that are related to, their, to food access. So food justice, uh, food justice activists see this as not an issue of inequality or a measurable difference between two groups, but an issue of inequity, right? an unjust distribution of benefits and hazards. Lack of access to food among communities of color is similar, in effect, to their disproportionate exposure to environmental hazards, like we heard about today in East Chicago. Both result in poor health outcomes, lessened life chances, and are linked to place-based racial discrimination. In response, the food justice movement argues that communities of color have a right to grow, buy, sell, and eat healthy, fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food that was grown not just sustainably, but ethically. It focuses not on improving access to good food, not only on improving access to good food in disadvantaged communities, but also on giving those communities the power to choose what their food environments look like. Something that uh, Dr. King felt was pretty important when he's talking about um, food and, and farming here in his sermon. Having the option to grow our own food is a key tool in dismantling the current inequities in our food system, but this goal is further complicated by some of the same racial policies outlined by Dr. King. Due to discrimination by individuals and institutions in the food system, people of color have been systematically removed from the land. Today, 92% of farmers are white, 86% of them are men, and they own 98% of U.S. farmland, which is some of the most expensive and valuable land in the entire world. In urban areas, communities of color are frequently relegated to areas closest to environmental hazards that contaminate local soil, air, and water that makes agricultural self-sufficiency difficult and even dangerous. Growing gardens in lead-contaminated soil is, by all measures, not a good idea. The culmination of these issues is this, is that the food system has, in the words of Dr. King, denied people of color their bootstraps. Food justice asks that we acknowledge and remedy this histor these historical legacies that have created contemporary inequalities and address them not th through superficial treatment of the symptoms, like hunger or lack of access to groceries, 
but by tackling the underlying syndromes that caused these symptoms in the first place, namely racial discrimination and economic inequality. So where do we start? Well, to borrow from the environmental justice movement's catchphrase, in your own backyard. Right? Recently, Indianapolis was rated the worst city in the nation for food access, with over one-third of the city designated as a food desert. Northwest Indiana doesn't fare much better, with 22 food deserts in Lake County alone. And nationally, we see that food deserts are not unique to urban areas, but are widespread across the country. So, what can we do? Well, food justice places the right to healthy and affordable food alongside basic human and civil rights. We can achieve this in many ways, through big and small actions. Locally, some activists are creating urban gardens and farms that employ as well as serve the disadvantaged communities in which they're located. Regionally, others are working to attract better or more grocery stores and to improve public transportation so that people can actually get to them. And nationally, some are lobbying to create legislation that better supports sustainable agriculture and food entitlement programs like SNAP and WIC. As our previous presenters mentioned, one of our senators, Joe Donnelly, is a member of the Senate Ag Committee and he'll play a huge part in drafting the 2018 Farm Bill, which determines not just farm but food policy for the next five years. So if you don't want to get your hands dirty in the soil on an urban farm, that's fine. You can use them to call his office and tell him that we care about food access issues in Northwest Indiana and throughout the state. Or you can get involved with us here at Valpo to create some student-run food justice programming, which is something that I would really like to do, so come talk to me. Um, or you can get involved with one of the many nonprofits throughout the state that are organizing activists and implementing food justice programs uh, throughout the region. Uh, some of these include the Sojourner Truth House, up in uh, Gary, the PAC Center in LaPorte, the Indy Food Council in Indianapolis, and uh, the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition, which operates throughout the state. One really powerful organization is also the Northwest Indiana Food Council. We're hosting our, our, our annual Fed Expo on February 23rd, the title of which is Just Food. Um, so this is a great opportunity for all of you to network with like-minded people and get involved in these issues if you so choose. Again, the need for meaningful food justice activism is right here in our own backyards. So whatever you think you can do, big or small, do it, because our rallying cry isn't that we can't wait for food justice, it's that we won't. Thank you. And last but not least, our anchor speaker today is Laurel Kilpatrick. She's a community organizer and activist on disability rights, environmental justice, including the lead crisis in East Chicago, and she works for Black Lives Matter in Gary, where she's a co-organizer. Her talk is entitled, All the Isms, the Interconnections Between Social Justice Activism in Northwest Indiana. So I'm going to speak from the podium only because of the microphone. And um, as a disability rights advocate, I know that the, the way sometimes hearing impairment works is not so much that you can't hear uh, someone's voice in terms of volume, is that you maybe can't discern what's being said. So I'm going to stand stationary here. Okay. So uh, I do not have a single slide because I thought that everybody else would be so well prepared that we could kind of just dig in and, and, and talk about kind of the, the experience of what all these things look like. And, and what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit of my personal experience with living in Northwest Indiana and from uh, my family's perspective, how, how all of these things worked out. So um, as was stated, I'm a co-organizer with Black Lives Matter Gary. And, and we really have so many connections with people all over the region in the Chicago land area because what people deal with in terms of environmental justice, in terms of racial justice, in terms of social class justice, is really very much interconnected. I know that the word a lot of people associate this with is intersectionality. For me, when I, when I, when I, when I say that word or when I think of that word, I think about that, that literal intersection, right? But, but to me, you still have people coming from different places, adjoining at one spot, and then going off into different places. And that still never really spoke to, to my reality or, or to my experience uh, dealing with all of these isms, right? Uh, as, a, as a lifelong resident of, of, 
East Chicago, Indiana, and then for a very brief time, Chicago Heights and East Chicago Heights, now known as Ford Heights, Illinois. Uh, environmental justice has been, or environmental injustice, has been a part of my life always. Uh, in uh, well, what became known as Ford Heights, Illinois, is everybody familiar with Ford Heights? Has everybody heard the name of that city? East East Chicago Heights, Marion Catholic High School. My alma mater is in Chicago Heights, and then you have an area that's closer to Indiana, Ford Heights, and they were trying to. Um, attract the Ford Motor Company to build their plant in the city. So they changed the name of the city before the Ford Motor Company committed to building the plant. And Ford Motor Company built the plant literally across the street in Chicago Heights from where Ford Heights is. I always thought that was interesting. <laughs> in Ford Heights, I remember as a child uh, when we moved there, the water used to fascinate me coming out of the tap. And it fascinated me because of the different colors that the water would turn. It would be an orange one minute, and then it would be maybe like a bright yellow the next minute, and then it would be like a dark brown the next minute. And it, it would just fascinate me. I would watch, my mother would enrage my mother because I would just watch the water come out of the tap. Uh, I had never seen anything like that. So very early on, we connected water to something that was extremely unhealthy, at least for us. Every two weeks, we would collect uh, milk jugs and take them to Gary, Indiana, to my stepfather's relatives' houses, and fill these milk jugs with water from their spigot from the side of their house, and then take them back home. Because of course, we couldn't drink that water. We bathed in it, right? I mean, we did what we could to kind of shield ourselves from, from the toxins that were obviously in the water. And we cooked with it, boiling it first usually, right? But, but that, that, that was my first and, and early memories in terms of, I guess, uh, our action to starve off uh, the water injustice. In terms of thinking about what to say today, I look back at uh, the biography that, that, I was, that I had written. And specifically, the topic is, is, envi is the environment. But if you really can't separate, again, uh, the experiences of race, social class, environment, accessibility or disability rights uh, from people's lives. You, you can't separate environmental racism from this conversation. I was a member of a, a manifestation of uh, the Indiana Green Party in Northwest Indiana uh, right after I participated in a group called the Coalition for a Clean Environment that did a lot of activism around that, that chemical disposal facility that was later built in East Chicago. The city of East Chicago sold a plot of land next to a high school across the street from a junior high school where they were going to put a stone cylinder. They weren't going to layer the bottom. They weren't going to build a top for it. They were just going to dredge that barge the chips came through and dump the sediment in that stone cylinder. So of course, when it rained, when it was very hot, right, you had those, you know, look like those little cartoon wavy lines that are coming up out of it and being dispersed through the air, right? That, that absolutely happened. And we, we starved that off for maybe a good year. Right? But of course, in terms of uh, for-profit industry, it was inevitable what was going to happen with that. They were going to build it. Uh, they did continue to poison the community. That's just how that story goes. But later being a part of the Northwest Indiana Green Party, that, that name came right back to me. I didn't remember it until right then. The Northwest Indiana Green Party, we had a conversation about how we could become more active in our immediate area. And everybody is throwing out ideas for issues that we could talk about. And I, I raised my hand. I was, I was the only uh, black person in this group. We all, we all had a connection through uh, being either employed or a student at Purdue, then Purdue Calumet, now Purdue Northwest Hammond. And, and I kind of raised my hand and I said, you know, we, we really should be talking about if we want people in this area to be involved, we should be talking about environmental racism and the silence that spread across the landscape of the cafe we were having this meeting in was amazing. And, and I kind of knew that would be the reaction, not because of maliciousness, but, but because this group, and I would say then the environmental rights movement at that time, wasn't really geared towards racial justice in that way. That wasn't really at the forefront of the conversation that that group at that time was having. 
But being a lifelong resident of East Chicago, Indiana, my family coming from a, a neighborhood called New Edition, which across the street from my family house, you had uh, BP oil tankers. And I remember thinking, you know, that's the one that's shaped like a baseball, that's the one that's shaped like a hot dog, because it was that close uh, to my family's home. And then later, moving a few blocks uh, east into um, the harbor area, coming outside, getting in my car, driving to college, and having my car covered with this sticky sediment, you know, sometimes during the summer, most times during the summer, not really so much in the winter. But these issues of environmental justice and then environmental racism was, was salient in my life. And I thought, I can't, I'm definitely not the only one experiencing it. So if we're in an environmental group, this should be part of what we're talking about. And spoiler alert, we didn't. The people who were involved in it didn't really know how to address that. They didn't, they didn't know how to, again, there was only one non-white member of this group, me. And uh, that's, that, that, at that time, was uh, a lot of the struggle that the environmental rights activists faced who were, quote unquote, of color or non-white. How do we kind of bridge the issue of racial justice and environmental justice together? It was difficult. And in that instance, it didn't happen. It didn't happen very well. It didn't happen outside of our awkward communications with each other, for sure. And this experience isn't just limited to this part of the country. I mean, we, we all know now it's, it's about the Flint, Michigan uh, tragedy that's still ongoing. The situation in Ford Heights is still ongoing, right? Um, in a study, titled Evaluating the Relative Environmental Impact of Countries. There are seven indicators of, environment de of environmental degradation that are listed. Na natural forest loss, habitat conversion, marine captures, fertilizer use, water pollution, carbon emissions, and species threat. Among my cousins and I, there's, there's and, and other young people in East Chicago, there's one thing that you know, right? You don't drink the water. Right, um, older folks drink the water because they've been drinking the water all along, and you know, if they haven't grown the third eye yet, it might not be that bad. <laughs> right, but if, if you're if you're about 40 or under, you you really don't drink the water in these areas, and for that to be something that's known, it's a colloquialism. It's very interesting. I was just kind of laughing uh, with Thomas about right after the situation in the, Calum the West Calumet area in East Chicago kind of exploded. Maybe about a month or two later, I saw this front page story about uh, Valparaiso. And it was literally front page, big, bold, black letters, you know, lead found in Valparaiso. And I kind of just looked at it and kind of went, huh, OK, really? Of course it is. Of course it is. You can't have an environmental tragedy like what's happening in specifically in East Chicago not affect the rest of the area. You just can't, right? But there are certain buffers put into place for some of us to feel it more, for some of us to be forced to feel it more. Generational illness, early death, perpetual illness ourselves, and then you have urban blight. You have a lack of resources. You have the inability, of your, uh, the inability of the resources in your community to take care of people when they do succumb to these sicknesses that have to do directly with the pursuit of profit over the well-being of people. In the same article, the top 10 countries with the most environmental threats are listed. The United States is placed at number two on that list. Uh, the United States is second to Brazil, which is the first, and it's followed by the third country, which is China. The United States ranked first for carbon emissions, second for water pollution, third for marine captures, and ninth for threatened species. And in all of these areas, what these countries have in common is the population of working class people that bear the brunt of these profit-driven abuses. We can't get away from that. We can't get away from the reason why. That's the best question that you can ever ask in any class, particularly a sociology class. Why? 
And you keep having to ask that question. Very young children, we dissuade them from asking why too many times because ultimately we're going to run out of answers. I think as we get older, there are answers. The answers are there. They're very uncomfortable. It's very unfortunate. Sometimes we don't want to hear it. But that question of why has to be answered. I pulled out some quotes from uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that we may not be so familiar with. In 1967, while addressing the members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King said that the evils of capitalism are as real as the evils of militarism and the evils of racism. I'll read it again. The evils of capitalism are as real as the evils of militarism and the evils of racism. We don't have school today, but we're going to do a little lecture. What's capitalism? Anybody? A layman's definition. What's capitalism? Holler it out. What's capitalism? Buying and selling. Buying and selling. What else is capitalism? Supply and demand. What else is capitalism? Profit over people, hashtag profit over people. <laughs> what else is capitalism? Anything? Private industry. Anything else? Free market. Free market. Well, it's free for some, not free for everybody. What else is capitalism? Anything else? Any thoughts? Anything that jumps in your head? I'm sorry. No measurement for externalities. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Money. Money. You take in more money than you put out. And if you don't take in more money than you put out, then you get that money from somebody else or somewhere else, which goes right into the definition of power. Being able to do what you want regardless of what other people want. Right? Because I'm sure nobody wants to live in these communities that are toxic. I played in the yards of West Calumet. I had relatives that lived there, particularly I used to get my hair done there, I used, to get my, used to get my jerry curl put in over there, of my aunt. We played in the dirt, we ran around in shorts, we splashed around in the standing water. All the things that there are signs on people's lawns telling people over and over again not to let their children do, and they still do, because you can't keep a kid locked up. This is where these people live, right? This is their home, this has been their generational home. And it's been poison. It didn't just get poison. It's been poison. So think of the generational damage that has been done over time. How can you repay that? That's another question. It's not necessarily rhetorical. If you have an idea, yell it out. How can you repay that? How can you remunerate that? What can you give somebody to make up for that? The woman in the first slide in the picture, I believe it was, was it Maritza? has lost her entire family. I'm not sure if many made it into their 70s. Her entire family. To now what can be tied back to this poisoning in that community. Who pays for that? We live in a capitalist society. We deal with money. Who pays for that? How can you pay for it? Where does the reimbursement start? How far back do you have to go? Because when you put it in terms of money, I think that's where these corporations come in. That's where they have to be held accountable. Very few people are willing to say that. And this is built into the system. It's not a mistake. It's not a horrible accident. There are people that get paid more money than me that calculate the human cost of doing this type of business. And in those equations, they have dictated that these people's lives, the lives of my family, the life of myself, I've not gotten myself lead tested. I'll admit, I just didn't want to know. Right? Who, who calculates that? What dollar value was put on that? How do we justify it? Because I guarantee somebody in here is thinking, well, it happened so long ago, who really has to pay for that? But we live in a capitalist society. We deal with money, right? Somebody has to be responsible. Send my check. Send it to my house. The evils of materialism and the evils of racism. Profit over people. That's a big one. It was towards the end of his life that Dr. King became increasingly vocal 
about connecting the dots of power and oppression both inside and outside this country. This is when he began to be a real threat. This is towards, again, the end of his life. When he began to reach across the spectrum of race and nationality, joining in solidarity with people whose oppression was tied to economic superiority of a ruling class, it was then that he became the biggest threat imaginable to that power majority. When the full depths of the damage done in the West Calumet neighborhood of East Chicago came to light, the potential activism of that area was staggering. And again, these are things that we knew. From living in this area, we knew that we were being poisoned. We knew it. Right? We knew it. But for the first time, you had enough people who knew it at the right time to do something about it. And that's what all of this culminates into. I got like four more pages. We won't get to that, though. Another quote, the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of power, oh, a redistribution of political and economic power. The Me Too movement, and tie that together real quick. You have Oprah Winfrey who made this, I, I don't watch award shows. I like Star Trek all day, all night, Star Trek. So I didn't watch the award show. But I, I did see a piece of the speech that she gave about seeking justice for people who had been abused through, through the, the wielding of, of unchecked power in Hollywood. And then I saw pictures of her embracing one of the main offenders of that power, a person with a long line of mental and sexual and physical abuse of people. I saw Barbara Walters do an interview with Corey Feldman and try to discredit his claims of he and Corey Haim's long-standing sexual abuse. What do these things have in common? The abuse of power, the silencing of the victims of this power, and the co-opting of this, of this suffering. Another quote from uh, Dr. King, revolution of values, from a speech he gave in 1967. When machines and computers, profit motive and property rights are considered more important than people. The giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. If I could, I'd like to add to Dr. King's quote, except in the face of multiracial, multigenerational, accessible, anti-sexist, anti-racist unity in the form of activism. And we have that. We have that. In all of these small spaces, we have that. We have people doing small things that can amount to giant things. I'm a disability rights advocate with Everybody Counts North and Hammond. We did an action with a group called uh, Adapt Indiana, where we went to talk about the cutting of Medicare or Medi Medicaid, right? Because people with disabilities are some of the majority of the folks who suffer under the ravages of environmental racism. And there was a reaction to that. There was a reaction by the power structure. That reaction landed me on my back with an ambulance surrounded by about nine um, US Marshals. But without that action, where are we? Last quote, again, we have deluded ourselves into believing the myth that capitalism grew and prospered out of the Protestant ethic of hard work and sacrifice. The fact is that capitalism was built on the exploitation and suffering of black slaves and continues to thrive on the exploitation of poor, both black and white, both here and abroad. From the Three Evils of Society, delivered by King in 1967. No wonder he was killed very soon after. That's dangerous. That kind of talk is dangerous. Uniting the suffering of people, not just within a country, but across national borders, is dangerous. But if we can unite the suffering of people here in Northwest Indiana against these almost insignificant borders, that can be as dangerous. And it's necessary if we're to go on, if we're to win. And we can. We have small victories, but we have to unite for action to win these large victories. 
I think my time might be up. So real quick, I want to say that Black Lives Matter Gary is doing a movie showing of a documentary called Who Streets. And it's going to be at Indiana University Northwest. And as I frantically go to my calendar, we will be showing that movie on Thursday, January the 25th. Uh, in Berglin Auditorium, and it's a documentary about the bravery of the very young people who are also ravaged by environmental injustice and economic injustice in Ferguson, and how they're able to live their lives while being these social justice warriors, something that may seem impossible, but it became possible because it was necessary uh, for their survival. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so uh, the question for everybody was where, where is the research that we're doing in East Chicago stand right now? Um, and currently, uh, we're very excited uh, with the new instrument that we were just able to obtain uh, from the Cosmans that will be able to do some on-site analyses for people uh, in East Chicago. And we're working to organize a uh, XRF day, which is the instrument that we have to bring ours as well as uh, uh, other instruments out there to help people bring anything they're concerned about in and, and get it analyzed. And that instrument's going to also uh, allow us to reanalyze the samples we've already done and do a lot more a lot faster. Um, so I've got a student uh, in the lab this semester uh, that's going to be working on getting that instrument up and running. Um, and uh, Dr. Peller also has uh, Zoe and Ashita are really interested in continuing their work. Um, and I believe we have maybe one more opening for another student that might be filled soon. So um, what we're really trying to focus on in this next phase, I think, is something that isn't really addressed by the EPA yet, although they may be starting to look into this, is that how, uh, how do we deal with or try and understand the mechanisms for the indoor exposure uh, of the lead. Uh, and as chemists, we're also really interested in knowing about things other than lead. Um, there's a lot of pollution in this area uh, that has nothing to do with the element lead, and, and those are things that need to be looked at as well. Uh, the water quality is an issue. Uh, so we're kind of trying to canvas all of that and, and really understand the health exposures big picture uh, of the community so that we can hopefully uh, have knowledge and information and power to try and, and fix, at least as best we can, some of those problems for people. Um, so that's kind of where it's at. Does that answer all your questions? <laughs> so many good things about that. Um, so for those who don't know, Balcomen is a grassroots community-driven um, organization that just came out of the deep end that Balcomen used to do residents and communities a few years ago. And one of the things that came out of that is wanting to prioritize 
now open access up to my be interested in consulting for any of these together or else. That's definitely a conversation that's interested in that. Kathy is a coordinator for Java Tech. I'm wondering, um, I can appreciate all the features, obviously, the well more, more so because of their familiarity with the, the issues that you folks do. But one thing that, that the well folks do is that we can do it. And I think that there are so many people in Northwest Indiana trying to do so many different things. We've got all the isms to battle. Can we, can we think of a way to bring all those strengths together? Because each of you, I see it kind of like a chart. Everybody's doing something, and we're all battling you know, the collective problem. But we, we're all human. You, if you want to do something, you only have so much time. You started something up. How do we bring that energy together? Because I think if we learn from one another, we're in a better position to educate those people who aren't in this world, who aren't working in this industry. And how do we do that? We're part of Northwest Indiana. How do we bring all of your efforts together? Because today is an example of the power and the energy in this room with this many people. How do we bring all that together? Well, I'll say really quickly, um, um, we've all been working together of sorts. I mean, the Hoosier Environmental Council has been working with us in East Chicago. We're kind of the, the community you know, strategy group or the Calumet Lives Matter. There's some other groups. Um, but we've all been interfacing with each other and we're building out a regional wild networks. We do have a reality in Northwest Indiana, these industrial fiefdoms and civic um, divisions. Uh, we have civic, civil society has been broken down, and especially in these areas, intentionally. Yeah. Uh, and, and that causes conflicts, uh, and privileging is, is it causing issues as well. One person's privilege over another in gaining access to a resource uh, causes some conflicts. So um, I think innate to the whole process is tension. And I think we have to learn to live with tension and work through tension uh, so that we can get you know, together better, larger. But that's what I would say right now. I think that uh, the internet has the ability to bring people very much closer together. And for folks who aren't as versed with the internet, um, I think we do have to get better at that. We do have to get better at our person-to-person -person connections. I know in Black Lives Matter, Gary, that's something that we've been forced to do. We're one of the few collectives that happen to be uh, intergenerational. We have people in the group in their 20s. We have people in the group in their 70s. So a lot of the communication that we do is just over the phone. It's just calling people or however they're able to access, you know, some type of communication uh, over the phone. So I, I think we have to take it back to those basics. Um, I think a lot of people will be able to engage online, but I think that in all of our groups, we have to have uh, purposeful connections with people in ways that they can access. And, and what I mean by that is, 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 is people who are older, because these are people, honestly, who have been facing these situations the longest. This is where we're going to get our, our history of the attempted fight back. I think every generation has had an attempted fight back. We may just not know about it. So I, I think one great way to engage the community is ask the communities where we're directly involved to start an information phone tree. I think that would be great. I think that would be excellent for getting people to be more sociable who may not feel that they have the ability to be sociable anymore. If people may not be as mobile, one thing they could do is pick up that phone and dial it. Right? So I think that a lot of that work has to come from uh, those of us who are digitally connected, but we have to kind of bring it back to the, the type of connections that people are used to who have been facing these things the longest. And, and that's some of our, our uh, older folks in our communities that want to be active too. That's a long drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I was looking at the data on the health level, I had like a, a dollar sign in that, but I still haven't really know like a lot of that in the debt. So I remember uh, on the morning of the level, I was like, oh, I don't know what to but I did want to spend a little over a year. And I remember that we never really had a, 
speakers that talk about this problem. Mm -hmm. So I know that now the whole lot of having uh, high school and online are on plants. They have no idea about the problems that our people have with drugs. The people who did take it. So I think it's all about the drug use. Then no. Absolutely. And You're inheriting this problem. Absolutely, if that's if that's to me. Absolutely, <laughs> I think I think there's a wealth of, of folks up here that can do that. But in terms of personally, absolutely, I can give you my card after afterwards, and definitely feel free. Do you want? So, uh, Alex De Silva he used to work with the EPA. I worked with him uh, on the water issues. He was in charge of what's called the RAP Regional uh, Remediation Action Plan on the Indiana Shipping Canal and the Grand Canal. He now teaches at Central. And last uh, after the EPA after the Superfund story broke. He, he approached his colleagues that he worked with to come in to speak to the community because a lot of his students lived in West Calumet or in Calumet, and they would not respond. Um, the EPA and IDEM would not approach him, would not return his phone calls. So he allowed me to teach all of his classes uh, for that day. Um, and I think um, there's an avenue to start doing more. We talked a lot. He was really feeling that if you really want to reach the kids in East Chicago, you have to start it at, and do it in junior high, that in high school they're perhaps too committed in a direction that they're going. So that was one of the things, and we're going to continue to do that. And Laurel has a radio show herself. I do. You can they let me on the airway. <laughs> um, I, I'm the co-host of a show called Issues and Answers Thursday uh, that is on 1370 AM. We broadcast out of Gary, Indiana. My co-host is Dr. Ruth Needleman, uh, who is Professor Emeritus uh, at Indiana University Northwest. And every week, they let us loose on the airwaves, and, and we talk about all things uh, affecting the region. We talk about race, we talk about class, we talk about the environment, we talk about politics, uh, we talk about music, we talk about whatever it is they let us talk about before they're going to kick us off the air with this show because we're causing a little bit of trouble. So yes, definitely, please listen. Thursdays from 6 to 8, uh, 13, what is it? 1370, 1370 AM. Um, and definitely call in, definitely contact me. I, I have my card. If anybody would like my card, feel free to come up to me afterwards and I will give it to you. You can contact me at that email address. And there's just so much to be done, but there's so many people doing something. And I think coming here today is doing something. 
Uh, I think it's the first step towards doing more, and I think that that can't be that can't be shortchanged. I think that that's that's very important to know that when you when you make yourself accessible to listening to these issues and to listening to some of these solutions, that's a step forward, right? And everybody has a little bit of time, right? Everybody's got a little bit of time to do a little bit of something. So this is really good. Bravo for folks that, that came out today in this snow. <laughs> I think being culturally uh, competent is the phrase. Uh, making sure that, that hmm. there was a nursing book that was recalled because it said something along the lines of African Americans don't feel the same degree of pain as other people. It stopped at the systemic cause of inequality that caused uh, health problems. No, I'm sorry, it stopped at the surface manifestation of these health problems without getting into the systemic causes. And I would say, and, and other people would have more to say, one of the best things you could do is to be culturally, to increase your cultural competency about what goes into illness, what goes into people having nothing but bad healthcare options that of course are going to result in a bad healthcare choice. And that could be with any situation. The situation I use for my class, it's a little extreme, but you know, if you're being stabbed and punched, and you know you're gonna die from me either stabbing or punching you, and I'm doing both, but let's say I stop and I give you a choice. You want me to stab you to death? You want me to punch you to death? That's not a good option. That's not gonna yield a good outcome. And this is uh, symbolically what a lot of these folks have to deal with in terms of their health care, right? Food or medicine, which one are you gonna choose? Right, so I mean, I don't know, some, some people, anybody else have something to say to that? No? Oh, okay. Um, I, I just want to say that it was a practitioner in Flint that actually brought the water crisis to the attention of the people who could solve the problem mm -hmm. of the EPA. Even though people living there knew there was a problem forever, it was a practitioner who paid attention and refused to not pay attention. Right. He got their attention away. So you have power. You really Absolutely. And also the, the one, one thing which, which I find to be tragic, more than tragic, is the forced medication of kids in schools, especially in East Chicago. Um, they're being forcibly medicated in schools for now what we can tie to prolonged prenatal and, and after they're born exposure to these toxins. So to look deeper into some of the things that may be on the surface. Right, to look at uh, the types of conditions that people are subjected to living in um, based on social inequality, right? Um, as opposed to, to coming up with remedies which could be very ist, I-S-T, in nature, whether it be classes, races, sexes. I couldn't help but think of a line from a song that went something like, 
what a, what a wicked web we weave. Um, you know, I, I think that it's really hard. All of these things are sort of integrated together, and it's it's very difficult to draw those apart. Um, I mean, it, you know, the DuPont facility manufactured pesticides. They're used all over on our food. Um, part of that goes to helping food be cheaper to produce, you know, more economically feasible, but then who pays that price? Where does that, where does that get extracted from in terms of the community that's now a part integral, integrated with this facility that produces those things? Um, and then we also had the issue of what, what is that cost? You know, how do we evaluate that for the people that are affected by this? Um, man, that's a hard, hard question to answer. I, I don't have an answer um, for that. And uh, there's probably numerous products, I think, that we could point to that come out of this community. Um, at, you know, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, this community built our nation. I, I cannot underscore that. It, it's phenomenal. And, and they're paying a very heavy price for that. So. Um, I, I think what I'd, what I'd emphasize in response to that question is, of course, a lot of the contamination that was discussed today is, is legacy contamination. It's from decades ago. And often those costs, those environmental harms today are being sent into other countries. Um, but in terms of one product that's still produced in enormous quantities here in, in Northwest Indiana and has great downstream costs, um, just to pick one obvious one, uh, it would certainly be uh, the gasoline that uh, most of us have, have perhaps consumed just uh, coming here. That's, that's a product with enormous outside costs, which are not yet uh, incorporated into the costs that we pay. Um, I, I also had a question for uh, Ms. Kilpatrick. Uh, is, there, uh, is there still a website where, uh, where WLTH is available? Thank you. There's a Facebook page, which is just at WLTH 13. I keep getting the call number wrong. 1370. WLTH 1370. The website is www.wlth1370.net. Um, there's a Twitter page. There's an Instagram. All that good stuff. Uh, you can always catch the show being streamed live. Uh, the recordings show up a day or two later. Yes, so, yes. Madam Chairman, I'm sorry to bring our, our formal part of the panel session <laughs> to a close, um, but there is some time between now and lunch, um, so I'm guessing our panelists will hang around for a few minutes, hand out cards, chat with people if you have uh, more direct questions. Um, but I need to fill you in on what's happening next. So, um, first, thank all of our speakers for their presentation. <laughs> Speaker Nicole Hannah Jones will be speaking in the Chapel of the Resurrection.